Good afternoon, friends, to all of you. Very glad to be here this afternoon and to see your gallant faith in Christ come out and sit in a hot building. Maybe it may have seemed hot to you people, but my northern blood's very thick. <laughs> it sure is hot. And I didn't have a little but the shirt said that coat, and I had a little thin alpaca coat on it, just merely my shirt. That's about all it is. I said, I sweat like everything in this. So I, I said, well, they don't seem very hot here to the natives, I suppose, because you're used to it. But I am so happy to be here. Brother Moore was just telling me that uh, they had taken up an offering for missionary work to be given over to me for missionary work. I thank, I thank you. May God bless you. I, I just don't know how to say it. I, I, it's just something about missionary that I just, just, I just love it. And I just know that what you're doing, you're doing God's will when you give the mission. That is right. It's not fair that one person hears the gospel twice when somebody hasn't heard it once. See, everybody should hear the gospel at least once. And I, I want to do my part to try to take the gospel to everybody that I know how, every place. And I'm used to on the difference of the remunerations of the meetings and what I have left over, I give it to charity organizations and so forth. And I have nothing at all against them, not at all. And I think they're all fine, every one of them, from the Salvation Army and the Volunteers of America, the Red Cross, Holy Old Drives, and many of those things. It's good to get to those things. But I thought the people that comes to my meeting are people who are usually poor people, and they're interested in the kingdom of God, while much of the world, of the people, of the common run of people that doesn't go to church, businessmen and so forth, write checks for them, drives and so forth for thousands and thousands of dollars, while a poor missionary suffers for the life. And after all, we know that we like to see everybody well, we like to see people hungry be fed, but you know, the soul is the most important thing of anything in the world. Oh, that's the thing that lasts forever. And I, and you know, I believe that every Christian is obligated to be a missionary. I believe every Christian is obligated. Now, not so much as you have to go over to the old countries and preach or something, but if you can't go, you can help send somebody else, you see. See, what you do to send somebody else? And did you ever think what Jesus said about when the disciples asked him when he would return again. Why, he said, show us the sign that when he would return, he said, you will hear wars and rumors of wars. That would be all right. You will hear fathers against mothers and mothers and parents against children and so forth. That's not yet. He said there will be time when they'll be all different and hit the moral, they'd marry and give in marriage and so forth. It's not yet. But he said, when this gospel is preached to all the world, then he'd return. And what have we done, Christian friends? We failed miserably. Is that right? I am, if you would only followed me in the last eight years since I've been in Phoenix the first time, and to see what I have seen, to see little hungry children on the street, little colored boys in Africa, little girls, drink from a muddy stream, the only water they ever know, and then maybe get chomped up with a crocodile while they're drinking. Never knew what a bath was. Never knew the name of Jesus Christ, nothing else. Never eat at a table in their life, find anything out on the field just for a uh, maggot. Eat maggots and all. Or that's all we know to eat. I was talking to a doctor here not long ago, two or three doctors standing in a sporting goods place where a man who runs a Sapphira in Africa was going to North. He'd pay my way if I'd go down with him in a hunting trip. 
They're going down on T.W. I said, I'm not going down there to hunt. I'm going to hunt for souls for Jesus Christ. And I was telling him about the native life. He said, well, Reverend Brandon, he said, you understand, those people, are, that's not human. I said, I beg your pardon, doctor. He's just as much human as you are, or I am. That's right. He said, oh, they could be. I said, what's the question come up about? I said, has all of our hygiene helped us any? If one of us would eat something like that, we'd die before night. But he'd eat it, and it don't hurt him. You don't find half the sickness among them that we find among us. We get some kind of a medicine, this might help something and cause us to have something else. See? I just wanted to tell this, Danny. I believe we'd be pretty as well off. We just went the way God told us to in the first place. See? Not a condemning that now, no. But watch, it shortens the days up. Well, there's an old colored lady sitting there claims she heard David Livingston preach. She'd have to be 130, 35 years old. See? And there, think of that. This doctor said, they're not human. I said, they're just as much human as we are. I said, doctor, you have tried for the last 6,000 years to get one mother out of the closest animal to the human race, which is chimpanzee. I said, you try to get one mother out of him, and you can't. He just absolutely can't think, and he, there's nothing about him, and no soul in him. But I said, give me a little bushman. That's the wildest tribe in Africa. Bring me a little bushman. He is great, 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 great grandfather. Never even seen a white man of civilization. The little boy don't know which is right and left hand. He don't know which day of the week it is or nothing. The only thing he knows is just what he can to eat. That's all he knows. Let me have him when he's six months old and come visit him when he's ten years old. He can read, write, and anything else. He's a human. And Jesus Christ died for him. And we were here on the churches in these big cities and things, the great big fine churches and all this stuff about a little handful of people and stewing around like that, and millions has never heard of Jesus Christ. That's right. Oh, that's a pity. Somebody get the vision and go. Let's go to the world. Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, what they want to know over there is the gospel. It's not the word, but the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. I met them coming into the meeting there, packing mud idols, sprinkled with blood. Coming down the street, the mayor of Durban, Sidney Smith, was bringing out where we, the streets and the hills and things just to pack with people. And he said, I said, well, look at those fellows, them idols, and what's that tag they got hanging around their necks? That's Christian. I said, with an idol? He said, yeah, they pack idols too. And I said, well, strange. I said, could you speak his language, that fellow stand there? He said, yes, he's a Zulu. And I went over to him, and I asked him, he couldn't speak English, of course. I said, are you a Christian? Yep, he's a Christian. And I said, well, um, what's this packing that idol for? Oh, he said, it, it, his daddy packed it. And I, he said, one day the lion got after his daddy, and he said, the, the little idol down and built up a fire and said the little enchantment that the witch doctor told him, and the lion ran away. Said, well, if Amalia uh, failed, that's God, the unseen, the word means the wind, the Amalia. We, they say we pray to the unseen force like the wind. If he fails, this won't fail. Now, you know that's not Christianity. Not at all. Well, I said, being a hunter myself, the line, the prayer that you said never run the line away. Now, never scared the line. The fire you build up run the line away. They just got scared of the fire. But that afternoon, when they seen the Lord Jesus Christ and his power of his resurrection, when there come a man across the platform, the first one on the platform at Durban was a, a little uh, Mohammed woman. She had a red dot between her eyes. There's perhaps missionaries sitting here now that know what that means. They've been to the temple, they've been blessed for the priest, a rejection of Jesus Christ, and accepting the Muhammad. When she stood on the platform, we had about 15 interpreters. And so there's different 15 languages, just as far as you can see, for city blocks with people just everywhere. And then they were laying there naked, in all kinds of conditions, different tribes. They had them fenced off so the tribes wouldn't be warning one another. And the missionaries and so forth that brought him in from way out in the jungles. 
They said they come in for two weeks. Thought she'd stay a long time. We'd be there for a long time. We're going to have three days. Then, in that afternoon, the first woman come across the platform. I said, of course, you know I couldn't heal you. The interpreter is. But I said, you couldn't hide your life. I said, then why, as you as a Mohammedan, why have you come to me as a Christian? She said to, to the interpreter, of course, I believe, she believes that I could help her. I said, well, why, why don't you go to your priest at the temple? No, she wanted me to help her. I said, well, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ. She believes Jesus Christ too, but not to be the Son of God. She just, the Mohammedans, that's Ishmael's children, see, they believe in God, but they don't believe Jesus to be the Son of God. They say Mohammed was the prophet of God. They rain this great big dawn every morning. The priest comes out and holds there's one true and living God, and Mohammed is his prophet. We believe there's one true and living God, and Christ is his son. So then we, um, then it's older than the Holy Spirit comes and begin to speak to her and told her that who her husband was, what his name was, spoke it in, Mo in the Mohammed, and, and told him where he was at the day before there and what he'd done to his wife and what doctor she went to. Then Muhammad got there began to scream, Krishna, that's her incarnated God, because they heard him say Christ. So the incarnation of Krishna, they thought it was that, so he had to watch that. I said, no, I never said Krishna, and I am not Krishna. I'm a servant of Christ, not Krishna. So he had to let it go through the interpreters again. Then the woman, she bowed down, took her skirt that was hanging down, wiped the red dots from between her eyes and become a Christian. So uh, that's strange for a Mohammed. So then went off the platform. The next one coming was a white woman. And she came, told her where she was at, what was wrong with her, just the fist on the ovary but said, prepare for death, or you're not going to live, but just a little bit a Christian. Now, if I'd been a healer, I'd have healed a woman. Many times I've seen death on people this last week, but I never said nothing about it. Because prayer could change it, but not this time. God has said it. I've seen the funeral procession, and I know it was over. I said, prepare for death, or you're not going to live, but a little bit. She said, how do you know that? I said, well, the same one to know what was wrong with you. She just done like that, walked off the platform, sat down, and for about 10 minutes, she dropped dead right there. They took her away. See, I couldn't, if I'd have been the healer now, I'd have healed her. But I can only say what he tells me to say. See? The next come was a little boy. He was standing there. He was a, a zoo. He had their, they cut their ears like this and make great long things. They wear a lot of uh, ear rings, they do. Women wear a lot of paint, so you women like to put on paint, you know where it comes from? It's a heathen worship. Exactly right. Keep it off of you. About the coming of Christmas. Thank you. I just wondered, when I first know Pentecostal people a few years ago, they didn't use them things. But something happened somewhere. Is that right? Ah, your preachers are here to teach you this. But look, ladies, there was only one woman in all the Bible ever put on paint. You don't put on paint to meet God. You put it on to meet man. Jezebel did the same thing. God fed her to the dogs. Do you see a woman a lot of things? You say, I do miss dog meat. That's what God made out of her. Dog meat. Give her to the dogs. That's it. That's it. How to do it. And I noticed a lot of the women taking on smoking cigarettes. Oh my, that's the littlest thing you can do. Amen. I better keep still on that. So anyhow, the preachers will tell you that. Um, now, back to this, these heathens. They get paint and put all over them, make it out of mud. Do make hair manicures, they're what you call it. Little mud things put up like this and put bones in it. Boy, uh, Beauty operator for a woman is an old thing they had. They had it a long time ago. So anyhow, fit the lips and so forth. Then make these earrings. They have some permanent earrings. And you let the flesh just keep putting chunks of wood into the rings, hang down like that, a flesh where their ears have been spread out. This little boy was a zua. And they, their diet, when they pack their dinners with them, they have a cow. 
And this cow, if a man has twins, there's a man, boy and a girl, he'll kill the boy. Save the girl, because he can get a cow for the girl. You can buy the girl at any age. You can't be with her as a wife until she's of age, but you, you buy her. And then the cow, they live by the cow. They take a porcupine quill and pierce the juggler vein, drain a little sack, a little, like a little leather sack made out of animal skin, half full of blood, then milk the rest of it full of milk, and while the milk's hot and the blood's hot, they churn it with a stick and it makes a lollipop. That's what they eat. So then this little fellow had just had his meal, and he had, uh, and they let it dry too, and it's called Fulton. And so they, they, they licked that lollipop, and the fresh blood, of course, warming up by his tongue. His little belly was just as bloody all over as he could be. He was standing there, and a poor little fellow to cross out his eyes, step right in like that. Well, I said, anyone knows that the boy's cross-eyed, just like I say, if there's somebody in a wheelchair, that woman's crippled. Well, anybody knows that. The mystery of it is the, the phenomenal is to see a healthy-looking person and know what's wrong with them, see? They said, what about the, the boy? I said, anyone sees? There's been stuff with doctors of Africa where the first thing was done the first night, called me down for breakfast, and the Medical Association of Africa gave me the right hand of fellowship. Opened every hospital in Africa for the people come pray for. Right. Then this little boy sat there, many doctors was on the platform, or sitting back in the back of this place. I said, of course, his little eyes are, are crossed. Anyone sees that. I said, the only thing I might know how it happened, if there's anything in the little fellow's way, that caused him to be that way, I'm, God might show me that, but to heal him, I couldn't. I said, Jesus Christ has already did that. When I looked back at the little boy, I seen a tall, thin, native woman holding a, the baby in her arms, showing it to her as a husband. I said, the baby was born cross-eyed. Now, way back over there when the Zulu interpreter said it, well, way back over there, the father and mother stood up, that was right. And it was that way. I said, besides that, they're Christian. I see you. Uh, that they're Christians worship and pray. The father and mother wave their hand, that was true. Well, I said, of course, uh, I look back at him again, his eyes are straight as yours is. No prayer, no nothing. Little fellow standing there looking at me, big grin, that great big mouth, you know, looking at me like that. I said, now you see what's happened? I said, you're looking at him there. I have never touched him, I haven't been in 10 feet of him. God healed him. He said, pass on through, little lad. And the man brought him on through. I turned my back like this, and I heard somebody fussing back there, and I looked around, his brother Bosworth. And Brother uh, Baxter, or Brother Bosworth one that's going on, is a young British doctor who had a lot of intelligence, you know, just got out of school and practicing, about 35 years old. And he was wanting to come to me, and he said, when the anointing is on the brother, said, we can't let no one talk to him, said, besides, look here, there's around 1,000, 50, 60,000 people sitting here to be prayed for us. Said, we can't do that. Said, I just want to speak to him. So I turned around, I said, what's the matter, doctor? To know he was a doctor, that shocked him. So how did you know I was a doctor? I said, well, I, you're a doctor. He said, that's right. He said, Reverend Bam, I want to ask you something. Said, what did you do to that boy? I said, never done a thing. He said, did you hypnotize that boy? I said, and they give you license to practice medicine and don't know about hypnotism and that? I said, if hypnotism will straighten that boy's eyes, you fellas will be able to practice some hypnotism. Get some success down. He said, well, what did you do to that boy? I said, doctor, you were standing right there. I had been in 10 feet of the boy. He said, I can understand how that your speech could have an influence on the people. And I understand that you could be a mind reader and read the people's minds. <laughs> but said, to make that boy's eyes straight, I can't understand that. And Brother Baxter said, you'll have to get, come off the platform, sir. Like I, I said, just a moment. He said, Reverend Brown, the great big cow lilies, you ladies talking about cow lilies, they grow wild. They're 18 inches across. <laughs> Yellow and white, the most beautiful things. They had great pops up in this bank, seven sitting on the place, the platform. He said, I know that God's in those lilies. He said, I'm a, I, I believe that there's a, a, a nature in those lilies. He said, but for that to be tangible enough, to make that boy's eyes come straight? He said, I don't see it. I said, Doctor, the boy's eyes are straight. He said, yes, I was the one laying through the gates down there. I examined him down there. The little boy's still standing on the platform. Said, I just examined him now. But he was cross-eyed there. His eyes are not crossed here. What happened between this face? I said, Jesus Christ met him. That's right. So they started taking him off. He said, just a moment, the big mic that was hanging this way, many interpreters sitting down this way, each way to interpret. 
walked out there before that before that audience said, I accept Jesus Christ as my personal savior. Like that before the audience. Like that. Then the next man come up there, leading him with a chain around his neck. Broke down like that. But he thought I wanted him to do a, a, a war dance. And I couldn't get him straightened up. So after a bit, so I saw the vision. I said, the man, of course I couldn't help him. But I said, the man was born in that condition. He's about 20 years old, I guess. A judge me, maybe 25. And the parents raised up. That was right. But I said, now, as he got his attention, I said, now, what he's thinking about, he's got a, a brother that's younger than he is that walked on two sticks like crutches, and he was hurt by riding a goat, riding on a goat, and the, and the goat ran over him or something, and it crippled him. But I said, I've seen now, and he's healed. And away down, about two city blocks, here come the boy jumping and screaming with the crutches over his head, or running to his house, screaming at the top of his voice. And about that time, I seen a blue shadow move above the man. I watched the shadow just a few moments, just like the alien congressman I saw. I seen the man standing up like this, right. He wasn't even mentally normal, but he was walked on his hands and feet, and his hips just stuck high, and his back was kind of, kind of diseased among them a dozen. I seen, I thought, that's the time. Now's the hour. I said, stand up. Jesus Christ makes you whole. He didn't know what I was talking about. The interpreter said it. He didn't get it. I walked over and got a hold of a chain that was around his neck, had leading us like he was a dog. And I took hold of his chain. I said, Jesus, make you whole. And started pulling up on a chain. And he went. And he stopped. And he looked so depleted and the tears dropping off his cheeks on his black belly. Then I looked around in his right mind. That's not fiction. They know that was Jehovah God. That was the man. I said to them, I said, how many of you people out there, your navies, this is your native boy. I said, how many of you people out there in this land, how many of you natives, which one of your mud idols can give this man this condition? I said, there's not a one. And to you, Mohammed, Hindus. I said, which one of the priests of the temple could give him this perfect sound? I said, none of them, and neither could I. But the God of heaven has raised up his son, Jesus Christ, who has given this perfect sound just like that. I said, how many of you want to accept him as personal Savior? And 30,000 stood to their feet. They, some of them run and said, Brother Bam, you better quote that again. Said, I believe they misunderstood. Let that go to the interpreter. But Brother Baxter said, I believe, Brother Van, they meant physical healing. I said, I do not mean physical healing. I mean that you're convinced that I'm speaking the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you forsake all other things and accept Jesus now, who you who are real sincere, that if, the, if you natives are sincere, break your idols on the ground. And if you Mohammeds are sincere, wipe the red dots in between the eyes is like a dust storm where they broke their eyes. 30,000 heathens. Receive Jesus Christ as personal Savior at one time. There's someone not knowing which is right or left hand. I said, do not wait. Don't wait till just some white man comes over and brings a lot of theology to you. Don't do that. But take this same power that now has made you whole, the same Jesus, and you go out in the jungle to a place where a white man can't go. Go out there and preach the land Jesus Christ in the resurrection. Lay your hands on them in the name of Jesus Christ, and they'll be healed in thousands times thousands. One raw heathen that got saved that day for weeks later was baptized on the average of a thousand a week. That's it. That's what God wants to do. Not educate this and send him over. He's a little suspicious of him in the beginning. But take the message of the resurrection and power and demonstration of the day you see it, and it'll sweep the gospel everywhere. When they see it in manifestation. Hey Amen. I didn't mean to say all of that, but I just guessed up too long. All right. That's the kind of a message by God's help and grace that your finance this afternoon will finance a program like that to bring the people to. As far as I know, not wasn't my meeting now. It was his meeting. It wasn't because I was there. It was because he was there. See? He was there. Now, by God's help, I'm going back right away. That's what I collect finance for right now, is see what I can get. We can't, what I get enough to go? 
I go. I use it every bit, everything. God knows that's the truth. Everything on that type of meeting. In Africa, India, and the way away places are going to Australia now, where man never even seen a man. That's for the more from the government picture we just seen that way. When they had their dances and things, the only thing they ever seen outside of their own tribe was a kangaroo. And they, they jump and act like kangaroos. That's right. Take a kangaroo and just, just draw the intestines out and throw him on a fire, hide and all. Jump out in there and get a half done and go eat him. Hide and all. There's the people who never heard the name of Jesus and Jesus Christ died for that man as soon as he died for the people that's walking here in Phoenix this afternoon riding in Cadillac cars. Hallelujah! Oh, I'm so glad to be on earth now, just before the break of day. Hello! The message of his blessed appearing. Lo and behold, the fig leaves now are becoming green. The gospel of the kingdom is sweet in every nation, and we're near the end, can be seen. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, as we bow in thy presence to thank thee for Jesus, thy beloved Son, who gave his life a ransom for us, coming down and saving us from a life of sin, that he might resurrect us in a new body at that great day, restore us back to perfection, where we'll never be sick no more, get old or die. God, it makes us with happy hearts to know that we've been included in that great resurrection that is to come. Thanks be to thee. And now, Lord, as we are going to open the Bible, thy word unadulterated, we pray that you'll give us the words to say just now, and may they fall in real fertile ground and bring forth a hundredfold, while we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now for the reading of his word, I want to read, and I won't keep you very long. I'm going to lay my watch out here so i am be sure not to uh, keep you long. I imagine 35 minutes will be plenty of time if you'll ask. I'm, I am not a preacher, and you understand that. I have never claimed to be since I met the full gospel people. Like one time I thought I was a cowboy when I was home. I told you about it, I believe. But when I seen a real cowboy, I, I realized I wasn't. <laughs> I could ride them old plow horses in the east, but I couldn't ride your outlaws out here. <laughs> All right. Now, Joel 1, over in the prophet Joel. 800 years before the coming of Jesus the first time, his first advent, the word of the Lord came into Joel. Hear this, ye old man, and give ear, ye inhabitants of the land. Has this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children in other generations. That which the palmer worm has left has the locust eaten. That which the locust has left has the canker worm eaten. That which the canker worm has left has the caterpillar eaten. Now, in the se second chapter of Joel, that's a dark picture to start a text on. But I want to bring it over a little farther. The second chapter and the 25th verse, here's where he gave the promise where I want to base my text. And I will restore unto you the years that the locust has eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat and plenty and shall be satisfied, and shall praise the name of the Lord God that has dwelt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. Now may the Lord add his blessings to the word. Now, God bless you. And I want you to give me your attention just for the next few minutes, God willing. I want to base my thoughts now on the end time. Let's begin to thinking before we can see, if you go out here, many of you people which are agriculture men here who raise crops and lettuce, and many fine things here in this valley of the sun, wheat, barley, another agriculture here in the valley, it's one of the most fertile valleys, I guess, in the nation. And so you'd be acquainted that knowing this, that what kind of a seed you put in the ground that's what kind of a crop you're going to have. So if we look around today, 
and think of how the world is in its condition today. What a great bunch of confusion and a great bunch of, of nonsense that the world is indulging in today. We wonder where all this comes from, especially in the church life. Being that we're Christians, we'll deal mostly on that. Of how could there be so many people with so many different ideas, so many different thoughts, so many different angles of approach to the gospel, everyone claiming they're perfectly right and the next fellow's wrong. When you see someone doing that, then you're pretty well on the line. The Bible said he that thinks he knows something, he knows nothing that he ought to know. Now, I was just uh, thinking of this great day, and the day of wickedness, peerless time, and man's heart failing, all that the scriptures spoke of. We are living to see the end time. I want you to go with me a little piece, some of you people. Go back, some of you elderly people sitting here, up to 40 years old, Pass back with me for the next 20th years back, and look how fast the progress has come, how much faster things are developing in the last 20 years than it did the previous 20 years. Watch how much faster than 20 years did the second block of 20 than when the third block of 20. And did you know only to about 150 years ago or less time that man was just as almost as primitive as in the beginning, 2,000 years ago? Did you notice how things are traveling so fast? We start right on this end. Here's the way time starts. At the first 6,000 years of life, we moved just like this. And we never changed to this until we got out in the last and we're just speeding like that. Why? We got the same man with the same mental faculties. Every scientific thing that ever was on the earth back there was back there. The same things you're making use of today. The same man with the same brain back there. He had the same brain that he's got now. But all at once something happened, didn't it? How could we say that this world could stand much longer? This world could never thrive on atomic war. It could never thrive a hydrogen bomb war. They can explode one in Reno or somewhere out in Nevada, burst up a little grenade like that. But what when this wicked enemy we got will break one here and one there, and those chains of relays will get together? Then what will happen? That's a war start. Then. I heard on the radio the other day that the biggest part of scientists of the world give the world 10 years to total annihilation. That's not scripturally speaking, that's scientifically speaking. 10 years for total annihilation. That won't contradict the Bible, just what the Bible says. The heavens and the earth will be on fire. Just sweep over these deserts and everything, there'll be nothing left. Then where's your soul going to be at that time, men and women? Remember, 500 years from now, your tombstone may blow right here on the desert somewhere once you way out of howling winds are blowing against it. Your tombstone's there, but where's your soul? Now's the time to think about things. We're living in a day when there's all kinds of cults and things is raised up. That was foreseen and predicted by the prophet and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, for a few moments, let's settle down, put your heart open before God and say, God, feed me now. I do the same thing. If you want to know there's nothing on earth now but what begin in the beginning. There's no new things before God. Now, back in the beginning, when the world first started, Every plant and everything that we have begin in Genesis. Amen. Genesis 
The word Genesis means the beginning. I think that's right in the text. The beginning. When everything began, then if, if plants begin in Genesis, if man began in Genesis, then religion began in Genesis. Is that right? Well, let's go all the way back now to Adam and Eve. Of course, when they come out of the garden, she bore two sons that we know of first, Cain then Abel. Two boys. Now, those boys, as to see if they had been made mortal and was going to die, they tried to find favor with God. And they both come making a sacrifice. I'll review a certain thing here I said last night. If God only requires religion, if that's all he requires, then Cain was justified. Cain comes just as believing, just the same as Abel believed. Cain come with a sacrifice just the same as Abel came with a sacrifice. But Cain's sacrifice was by works. He raised his garden, brought his fruits the best he could find by works. But Abel was justified by his pain. He come with a lamb. Watch. You'll see where fanaticism began. You'll see where all of these cults began. You'll see where all this confusion began. And by God's help, may the Holy Ghost place it in every heart in this afternoon so deeply that it'll never come out. Now, then Cain came and knelt down, built an altar. I'd imagine they come to the east side of the gate, for there's where the angel stood with his flaming sword, guarding the tree of life. By the way, he was guarding the people away from the tree of life. Now, now he's here trying to drive the people back to the tree of life. Jesus was that tree of life. The woman was the tree of death. We're the fruit of our mothers. She was the fruit tree. And when she, we come here, by, by a woman comes death, and by a woman comes life also, which brought forth the man, Christ Jesus. But the woman, when a wild born the natural, sexual, that person has to die. But the man that's born of the Spirit of God never dies. He, when he stood there with the Jews, and they said, our fathers eat man and women, he said, they're everyone dead. He said, but I am the bread of life that comes from God out of heaven. He that eats this bread shall never die. What is he? The tree of life. And just as sure as we come here by natural birth and has to go to the dust of the earth, that sure as we touch the spiritual birth, we go rise from the dust of the earth. Yeah, yeah. Watch him. Then King come religiously. Billy him an altar, a church. Now down, I watch these two vines. I'm going to make them vines right here. Now, Cain came and knelt at the gate, not an infidel. Many of us think of the Antichrist being Russia. Get it out of your mind. Never. The Antichrist is religious. Jesus said the two spirits would be so close to the sea, the very elect is possible. Amen. Don't worry about Russia. They're just a bunch of atheists. Yes, but the Antichrist steps right by you. That's the deceiver. Remember, just the time that Judas, Jesus Christ come on the scene, the Antichrist come on Judas. By the time Jesus revealed himself as the Son of God, Judas revealed himself. Just the time Jesus went away, Judas went away. Just the time the Holy Ghost come, the Antichrist spirit come. And they were brothers in the same church. Amen. Oh, I love the word. Look, it sets life in you. Notice, that's God's word. Now when King offered his sacrifice, religious, bowed down in worship. And as far as fundamentally, 
He was just as fundamental in his religion as Abel was. If God is talking about fundamentalism, God requires worship, Cain worship. God requires sacrifice, Cain give a sacrifice. But he did it in the wrong way. Now we're going to start with this because I see my time's going to move quickly. Now let's start with these two vines right here. I can take anything that you wish to as all earth today and show it to you in Genesis. And she's coming to the seed now. That's why we got so much confusion. It's cutting out other lives. See, like a grain of wheat started with a grain, but it ends up with many grains. That's where all these isms come from. All this nonsense comes from. Where all this adultery comes from. Where all this immorality comes from. It began in Genesis, in the beginning. And it's been stalked like a garden. And the true wheat come up among the weeds and a cup of birds. But it's been wheat all along. You always talk about how bad the world is. How wicked the world is. That's true. But look how great the churches are getting all the time. We fail to look at that side. Jesus said, let them go together. When the world's getting wickeder and wickeder and wickeder, the churches get more powerful and powerful all the time. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God will raise up a standard against it. Hallelujah. Get still. Glory. The winds are going to touch your sails. Hallelujah. Move right on into the face of the storm. What do you care? Who's the captain? You'll take care of it. Now, don't fear. I'm always there. See? Notice these two coming now out of Genesis. Let's bring them up. There he was. Cain, as soon as he seen that God blessed Abel, he becomes jealous. Is that right? A religious worshiper becoming jealous. Now, Cain died, but not his spirit. <laughs> then he come over and killed his brother. Is that right? Perfect type of Judas and Jesus again, see. Let's bring them on further. We can bring it on through to the ark all the way. But I want to get something to you before it's time to get away. Notice, let's bring them on up to the Bible. Right in the days God called Israel out of Egypt. Perfect type of the church. And when he already come out, God that night gave Israel the command by a lamb, step up. Fourteen days must be found without a blemish, and it's killed in the evening time. All Israel laid their hands on him, and then he was killed, and the blood was put on the little door and so forth, and they went in under the blood and stayed out of the blood until the marching time come. Perfect type of Christ. No one could find any fault in him. Pilate said, bring me some water, I'll wash my hands of him. The Roman centurion said, truly, that's the Son of God. Judas said, I'll betray innocent blood. No one could find fault in him. He was the faultless Lamb of God that was tied before the wicked rulers of this world. Then, in the evening, all Israel gave witness to his death. Let his blood be upon us and our children. And he was killed. There was a bone broken in his body, a sacrificial lamb, of course. Perfect type. When Israel come out of Egypt, God promised to supply everything they had need of. And that was the church natural, hyping the church spiritual today. How? And when they crossed the river, the Red Sea rather, got on the other side. They were without bread. They eat all they had. God promised to take care of them. That night, manna rained down out of heaven, filled all the ground around. Next morning he went out, God had supplied them bread. And they'd pick up some little pieces of wafer and eat it. They said it tastes like honey. Yeah. Sweet. Did you ever taste any of it? That was a perfect type of the Holy Spirit coming down to supply food for us while we're in the journey, going to the promised land, the millennium. Beautiful time. I want you to notice. He said, don't pick up too much of it. Just what you can use today. Don't try to go to church one day and get enough religion to last the next year. It won't last. <laughs> that tip over got wiggle tails 
in it. That's what's the matter with a lot of the Pentecostal churches today. And others, you got a lot of wiggle tails trying to go on an experience you had years ago. Let's get a brand new one right now. <laughs> All beautiful times. And remember, the manna never ceased from that day until we entered into the promised land. And the Holy Ghost that fell on the door of Pentecost will never cease falling on the church till the millennium comes. Jesus comes in power. You'll power again. Notice another beautiful type. Moses told Aaron, and he told the others, to go out and gather up several big omers full of it. If they could keep it behind the Holy of Holy so it wouldn't spoil. Such a great miraculous thing. He said that every generation after that, when a man become a priest, he could go in and get a mouthful and taste a mouthful of the original manna. When they'd ask, what is this? They'd say, it's from the beginning. A mouthful of every man. Here it is. Every man that comes to the priesthood, which we're all in the priesthood now, every man and woman, Come into the priesthood, we are a royal priesthood, the peculiar nation, offering spiritual sacrifices, the fruits of all of it, giving praise to his name. Every one of us are priests that's born again. In that day, he said, keep this, and when every time a priest is ordained, go in and get him a mouthful of the original manna. What a pain. What a vindication. What an evidence. And when the day of Pentecost is going to come, God was going to supply the manna for all the Holy Ghost age. They were all in one place and one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. They were all the room where they were sitting. Twelve and tongues set upon them like fire. They couldn't hold their peace for all. They're out into the streets. They went leaping and jumping and screaming and tearing off like a bunch of maniacs. Peter told him, but not just a minute. <laughs> Over the Lord, some overfalls of this thing. Said, repent everyone of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, in this of your sins, for the promise is unto you and to your children. And the name is far off, even as one as the Lord our God shall call. And the six sheep are going to lick the honey off the rock. And licking the honey, he got some of the limestone, and the limestone healed the six sheep. <laughs> I got a whole strip bag full of you this afternoon. Now I'm going to put on the rock Christ Jesus, and your six sheep go to licking. I'm putting you to get some of this. There's honey in the rock. And remember, brothers and sisters, I'll not put it on the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, the Pentecostal Church. I'll put it where it belongs on Jesus Christ. <laughs> Yes, six sheep just lick, 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 and you're sure to get some of the limestone. Just shout to the top of your voice, scream to the top of your voice. While you're licking, you're going to get some virtue in there. <laughs> Amen. Yes, honey in the rock. David spoke of it. All right, the rock. There's some kind of an element in a rock that does healing. The old timers used to, when someone got bit by a mad dog, they stuck him against the mad stone. If he stuck, he got well. If he didn't stick, he died. A brother, the worst mad dog I know is the devil. And the best cure I know is the rock of ages. It's a devil cure. The most sin in sickness. All oh, that the church needs today is not a new building on the corner. It's not a new pipe organ in a 
church is some new speak. What it means is a good old time St. Paul's revival in the Bible, Holy Ghost, back in the church. Repentance preached in the power and the simplicity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me, says Jesus. Holy Ghost and fire. When we let the fire go out, we're thinking. I think of the day great theologians, I stood in schools and seen with a great big fire painted and the great things that happened on the day of Pentecost, and they produced it all to be in history. How can a freezing man get born by a painted fire? <laughs> How can a starving man eat from a painted picture of food? God is not a man who will entice and tantalize with some painted picture what the Holy Ghost was done, what Jesus Christ was done, he is now just the same. He was the same yesterday, today, and forever. Certainly, we just need the fire. Let the fire go out of your church, brother, and the church is gone. Right. Someone said, not long ago, said, Preacher, if you ever a long time ago, there's an old colored man in my city. And he got the Holy Ghost. He was a Baptist too. And he got the Holy Ghost. And the order has come around to him and said, Fella, you know what? If you don't quit preaching like that, you are sure going to kill your church. He said, look at that, Elder. He said, any church that ever dies with the Holy Ghost fire in it, he said, I'll climb them old vines out on that wall to the top of this pinnacle, lay my black hands upon the top and say, Blessed is the law, the dead, the dying of all. <laughs> Reminds me one time, my brother and I were out walking with a little kitty. Yeah, I seen an old turtle. I don't guess you had in this country. And oh, they walked so funny, you know how you walk. I thought it was the funniest thing I ever seen. I went up to him to pick him up. You know what he done? He went right up in his hole. Just to remind me of some of these old coal farm or churches when you go to preach in the gospel. <laughs> That's right. Hey, the miracle just passed. That's dangerous. Don't fool with it. You know what I done? I went and cut me a long wheel of switch. I poured it on him. Didn't do a bit of good. Not a bit. You can't beat it into him. That's right. I said, I'll fix him. I took him down the creek and stuck him down the water. Just a few bubbles come up. That's all. Brother, you can baptize him this way, that way. Head foam with that side, anything you want to. They go down a drop. Then there come up a wet one. They're still standing. I couldn't make him move. You know what I done? I got me a piece of paper and some wood and tin a little fire and stuck the old ball on it. He walked in when I needed to go. Still 
God takes his man, but never his spirit. He took Elijah and put a double portion of his spirit upon Elisha. He come out on John the Baptist hundreds of years later and predicted to come again in the last days. Is that right? Same spirit. See? All right. He's taken his son, but his spirit remains. <laughs> the Holy Ghost, which is with us, the same as it ever was. Notice, the devil takes his man, but never his spirit. Remember who condemned Jesus? The scholars and big churches and renowned people. The educated people who know theology to the very utmost, but they didn't know Jesus. That's it. Yes, sir. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. I don't know too much about the word, but I know the author real well. And that's the main part. I know the author. All right. Notice, the more night, they sit up there and call this prophet down there to curse Israel. Now, I want you to notice. Now, you fundamental people put on your coat. Listen. I mean the shock coat. Notice, here comes Moab. Here comes Israel with God's commandment to journey to the promised land. Going exactly the way God promised them. A very beautiful type of the Holy Ghost Church today, journeying on with the same baptism, eating the same manna, moving right on to the promised land. And here was a bunch of fundamental believers. Walk out to say, no, sir, you're not starting that fanaticism in my country. See them, see them by? They're seen and able again. Notice, one verse in the other. Now, you say what's the Mobanite fundamental? Watch what Balak done. Or Balaam. Balaam. He called all the princes, all the DDs, out of the country. And he brought them down there, and they built seven Orders, the same kind of orders that Israel had built down there. Seven is God's perfect number. And he offered seven bullocks, the same thing they offered down there. Yeah. Speaking clean sacrifice. Notice, there it is, Christian. And he offered seven rams. Yeah. Speaking of the coming of Jesus. Yeah. I'm going to let that soak for a minute. Fundamentally, he was just as fundamental as Israel was. Both of them had seven orders. Both of them had seven sacrifices. A bullock, seven rams. Worshiping the same God. Amen. If that is your picture today, I don't know it. Don't ever tie to a fundamental man. He knows what he's talking about. But that's all he knows. <laughs> he doesn't know Jesus with it. Notice, if he did, he would accept the truth. Watch, here he is. And here's the man up here. Now, if fundamentalism is what God requires, he would accept it as a king. If fundamentalism is what God requires, he would accept it at the hand of Balaam. For he's offering the same sacrifice that Israel was offering at the bottom of the hill. Don't talk, well, sure, I believe in Jesus Christ being the Son of God, certainly. Do you believe that uh, he died, buried, rose on the third day? Absolutely. Do you believe he set the right hand of God making it? I certainly do. Do you believe he will return again? I'm preaching every day that he will return. Fundamental. See? The fundamental does the same thing today. Preaches all the fundamental doctrine of the church. There is just as fundamental as Pentecost ever dared to be. That's right. But notice, the only difference was that they had signs and wonders for them, and they didn't. <laughs> God was vindicating his church with signs and wonders. He always has, and he always will. <laughs> the same sacrifice, the same religious ritual. But God was vindicating him just like he did Abel. There's that king spirit up here, fundamental, religious as he could be. Here's boy the same way. But he had no time for signs and wonders. Israel had a pillar of fire hanging over him. He had a brass serpent before him. He had a smitten rock one with him. And that was a bunch of holy rollers down there carrying on. You said holy rollers? Yes, they were holy rollers. The RDS, it was then. He said, Holy Lord, sure. When they crossed over the Red Sea and got the victory over their enemy, before they could eat the manna, 
I tell you, Moses stood up and hold his hands up and sang in the spirit. And man, Miriam took a tambourine and began to beat the tambourine and jumping and dancing to all Israel. If I don't have a Holy Ghost meeting, is that right? They were a bunch of holy rollers. Look silly before the world, so did Abel. But you see that vine coming up? Still the same vines. She's going out on out of Genesis. There comes the fundamentals up too. Just this fundamental. Look. Oh, my. I wish I had time to dawn on it, but look. Bring the Spirit on down. When Jesus come, those priests were just as fundamental as Jesus was. Yet he had signs and wonders, and they was against it. The great St. Paul said, up here when the vine goes forth into the blossom and begins to put forth as we are now, he said that these heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, truth breakers, false accusers, incompetent, and despisers of those that are good. He said, brother, damn, they're infidels. No, no, fundamentalists, having the form of God in this but denying the power of God. Vindicating his church in all ages with signs of wonders. There's that same vine. Do you see where we're at now? See how these great fine classical churches can deny that power, yet preach the same Bible, believe on the same Christ, and everything just as fundamental as we do, but they're scared of the power of God to make manifest doors. All right. I might as well cut up because it feel good. All right. Oh, brother. What a peculiar text I had a while ago. Never got to it yet. But when I was thinking of it, I'll have to hurry. Do you see where we're living at? This last day. Paul said in the last day that man would be heavy and high-minded. They'd permit their people to go to shows and dances and clubs and everything else, having a form of godliness. Going all through, we believe the death, early resurrection, second coming. We are pious, we are believers, so are those priests, so are teens. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power of God's divine healing, the power of speaking in tongues, the power of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, signs and wonders, powers, they say it's fanaticism. Oh, fundamental brothers, step off that tree this afternoon and get over here. There's some time ago, I was up in British Columbia. Two years ago, I could come from Africa. I was so tired, I couldn't hardly go. They taken me way back in 700 miles from a hard top road, about 70 or 80 miles back for horseback, hunting. Back there one day, I was chasing an old grizzly bear. Got out there and got on, got shot and praised the Lord. Bear got away from me. So I didn't care about him anyhow. So I come on back. I got lost coming back. Where is the night coming in? And when I was coming down, I was trying to say we couldn't find no track. The moon was out, clouds had come on. I passed out through an old burnt over place where the fires had burnt years ago. Oh, that's a spooky looking place. But me mind some of these old formal churches. I looked in there, and that moon shining against there looked like tombstones. Directly at the water, there come a wind coming down from heaven. And it went out through there, it went, ooh, I thought, oh, my, spooky. I thought, Lord, why'd you let me get lost and bring me out in a place like this? Out here, that old mournful sound, ooh. I thought, oh, yes, I see what you did, Lord. One time, those were big trees, but the bird overcome, and it burned them down. Like a lot of these big churches can say, look at the Wesleyan revival. Look at the Calvin and Knox and all those revivals. They were big cheer trees. They stand today as some big fire, but dead. What's the palm the one left the caterpillar eating? What's the Methodist left the Baptist eating? What the Baptist left the Presbyterians eating? What the Presbyterians left the Pentecostals eating? Oh, my, until they got the tree, so it's buried, split. What the Methodists had is shout and so forth, the Baptists robbed them of it. And there it come down so there's nothing left in the tree but just a big, big old stately tombstone standing there. That's right! Just a big old tombstone. Oh, we are a church. Sure you are. 
but that's gone. A big old tombstone. Then all at once, there come that wind coming down like a rushing mighty wind coming from heaven. It will run through it and the only thing they could do was moan. First thing mighty church today when the Holy Ghost hits the country and signs and wonders begin to come up, the first thing you know they say, mmm, there is a miracle this time. Oh, such fanaticism. Oh, there are trees, all oh, I've in them. The bark, the bark has been burnt off of them and the light can't come up no more. I said, oh Lord, what will happen to the church? I thought of this text of Joel. What the palm one left the caterpillar eating. What one left the other eating. But I read over a few more verses and said, but I will restore, saith the Lord. I thought, Lord, how are you never going to restore? And as I was sitting there on my horse, looking around, him starting around, I got him stopped a few minutes. I said, Lord, how will you restore? And the first thing you know, the wind come again and I noticed that down beneath these old trees come up a bunch of little trees. And the wind hit them, they were flexible. I said, if they ain't a Holy Ghost revival, just step in your car, get in the wind. Hallelujah! When the Holy Ghost comes back to rush in the wind, there is an undergrowth coming up called in the outer wall, backwash. Hallelujah! What is it? It's coming up. When the Holy Ghost falls, they can only condemn it. That's all they can do, stand there and start eating. <laughs> oh, there's no such a thing. Dr. Jones told me it was. That's all psychology. It's all worship. But don't you hope there's some down here just to rejoice in the He said, no, every time they have to have wind or your tree ain't got no grounding. Every time the wind blows on a little tree, it pulls them loose, loosens it up, takes it a deeper hole. Hallelujah. Every time the Holy Ghost falls on a man, it roots it and grounds him in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You're loving Just let the Holy Ghost move through your hands. Just brush along like an old time revival. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee today that you said I will restore. I pray, God, that you'll restore the faith that was once delivered to the saints in Phoenix again, Lord. Pour out those, Lord, who have been called. Set them in order. Put your church in order, dear Heavenly Father. Grant while the Holy Ghost is here, the spirit of eternal life. May it rest upon everyone. And may they see today, Lord, that fundamentalism isn't a fact. It's the signs and wonders of a vindication of God's Holy Ghost being with the people. We thank thee for the pillar of fire moving with us today. We thank thee for signs and wonders. We thank thee for the stored manner of glory, the baptism of the Holy Ghost to be to every generation. We thank thee that we have posted and seen the Lord is good. Oh, God grant that every heart will be melted into one great big unit of the Holy Ghost Church that will move forward. And may the power of God sweep into this building right now and baptize every